Started in 2013, Warehouse is an architecture and art collective that constantly experiments and explores architectural practice through collaborative processes and interventions. Warehouse believes that architects are mediators who are aware of the impact that such space activations can have on the community and therefore their hands-on and responsible construction practice hopes to impact larger cultural and social extents. I am joined today by Ruben Teodoro, one of the co-founders of Warehouse, and we will just converse on the topics of collaborative architecture and horizontal learning, of course, within the context of impact creation. So how are you, Ruben? Hello, Karina. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, thanks so much for being here. We can't wait to hear your sharing. So first and foremost, can you tell us more about Warehouse, maybe how it started and all that? Okay, so besides what you already introduced, I would say that Warehouse is, uh, we are now more or less moving to our eighth year of existence. Mm -hmm. The values are more or less the same since the beginning, but our structure and our team and our reach of projects, is, it's, it's something that we accept since the beginning that it involves in a, and adapts to different conditions that depends, of course, from our experience, from uh, the individuals that are part of the collective. So it's something that since the beginning, of course, it had been changed a bit, but always in this very organic, natural way, uh, how people grow and how collectives grow. So we started in 2013, as you said, we were a, a bunch of students, uh, mostly from architecture, that we were in this transition between ending university and starting work. So, you know, this limbo uh, area that normally you don't know anything and you are looking for to find yourself as a professional. <laughs> By the time we start just by creating this kind of uh, work space and work common uh, ideas. We also had uh, one or two designers with us on the beginning. In the first year, we reached almost like 14 people, something like that. Uh, a nightmare of, uh, <laughs> of uh, management. And then, yeah, and then from there, people got, got out, people got in, and we've been involving. We, we also assume different shapes, like officially, like associations, cooperatives, companies even. So we've been trying out all, all these uh, ways of doing it. And here we are now. <laughs> we are now uh, four, uh, four members fixed, working in a collective warehouse. And then we, we work uh, aside with, with other people from our network that depending on the projects we we get more people in and, and we go from there. Mm. Well, I guess the philosophy has always been the same, that it has always been collaborative, participatory, and, you know, together. Yeah, I think it's a little bit the DNA. Uh, it comes from there. So we started as a collaboration group of people looking to share something, some visions. And we extend that as well to the outside of the collective. I think that mostly that's why we call ourselves a collective. It's because, I mean, there's a core of people working here, of course, but there's not so uh, defined limits of where the, where the collect right. collective uh, can go. And that's why we, we use so much this collaboration uh, concept. Right. And as a collective, and I kind of mentioned this briefly in the intro as well, that you perceive your role as an architect, as a mediator. Do you mind elaborating more on it? Yeah, I think the mediator is, is a kind of, we are humans, we, we are used to try to find words to, to <laughs> label uh, things. And I think that mediator is one of, it's not the perfect one, but it fits the purpose. And I think that, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely what, what you're saying. So it's this idea that we use a little bit the tools that architecture gave us and it's giving, still giving to us. Uh, also the fact that we work a lot in public space and um, 
common spaces and uh, community spaces, if you want, as well. And this gives us kind of a position in the processes that we can reach a little bit all the, the strength of the process. So we can go really close to somebody that's going to be the user of a space. Yeah. Uh, we can reach really close as well from somebody that is building the space itself, like the builders, or even sometimes uh, ourselves as builders as well. Uh, and we can go as an architect for a formal meeting in a municipality or with the government or something like this. So this kind of chameleon ability, it's somehow what we call the mediator because in the end we are just connecting or trying to connecting all of these uh, actors. Um, and, and we see that as a, as a responsibility of our position as architects. Mm, I see. So with this whole participatory practice and collaborative architecture, uh, yes, I think we can all agree that it is education that can produce positive continuous effects, especially through the skill and knowledge transfer, right? Can you maybe give an example of this happening in your past experiences? Yes, of course. Uh, but still it's something that it's very untangible so it's something that right. is not you cannot see it like uh, black on mm -hmm. white something that is completely uh, and physically shaped in a way or something like that so it's something that it's in between a lot of things but but i would say that there are a lot of uh, examples that that we can somehow see that th the way we all work in one project and when when i say we all I say we as collective warehouse but also all the people involved that normally goes with the we met in a local community or or uh, the municipality or an artist or whatever so the way we all do it together in a positive collaboration immediately even if we don't want to we are sharing knowledge to each other we are um, influencing each other in, in a good way. And of course, from that, uh, normally you get positive outcomes. As an example, sometimes we see that after a process like this, you see that uh, these people that work in a big, big inst public institution, for instance, they change a little bit in a good way, the way they are more proximity uh, to a citizen, for instance. Mm -hmm. And and in another way, if we are, for instance, doing a participative uh, dynamic or process in, for a square, a public square, people normally feel that they are not architects or urbanists, so they don't have anything to say, or they don't have the, the technical right to say something about it. And after a process right. like this, they actually get this empowerment that their voice is, is heard now, so they can actually say what they think about their own square and they can actually be be more active after this so i mean these these are random examples but i think that it's a little bit in the end it's the small outcomes that we are always looking for in our projects it's this idea that we are all uh, very important especially when we are talking about uh, building a city or a public space for a city yeah. we are all valued and we are all full of knowledge to share on that. We right. don't have to be architects or urbanists or government or whatever. Right, because everyone has different views, especially in a public space, right? Everyone is a stakeholder, so everyone's opinions matter. There's a collective that we, that they are our friends, it's a Spanish collective, collective. it's mm -hmm. called Zuluark. And Manu, one of the members, he normally said that the the answer for the so the solution for the problem it's always there already so if you have a problem in a public space on the square or something it's always there already somewhere in one of those people that use it they have the answer which our work actually is just to make them work with us speak their voice right. and and hear it and then apply it so it's already there normally so it's a little bit uh what we are what we are uh, yeah. talking about here right right 
And so I'm very curious, do you think the different extent of the collaboration, so how much involved someone is in the project, will yield different kind of attachment or association with the project? Def definitely, yes. For the good and for the bad. So because when, I mean, when you are collaborating in a project, no matter what uh, background, professional background or agenda do you have. So if you are just taking part of a project, I mean, the more you are involved in it, the more it's, it becomes your project. Um, so and that's, that's why I was saying for the good and for the bad, because of course for the good and, and normally it's what we are reaching or trying to reach in our project is the engagement with, with the citizens or the engagement with a group of people that is working on a specific project with us. Uh, and of course, the fact that they are collaborating, they feel that they are part of this team, uh, makes them uh, uh, appropriate the whatever outcome of the project is, is being produced. So let's say if it's a building or a renovation of a public uh, square, um, the more they are engaged and involved in this collaboration, the more they feel that this is their baby as well. Mm -hmm. That, of course, also have a less positive side that it's all of these, it's a, a gamble of expectations. And some, sometimes uh, the more you get involved in something, the more, the bigger expectations you get. And sometimes, I mean, there's always limits, there's always budgets, there's always laws, there's always uh, humans that are complex and not easy to please everybody. So it's, uh, of course, it, it's very, I think that collaboration, you get a lot from it, but it's also energy uh, demanding because it's something that you really have to put your energy in and, and to be able to manage these, um, these expectations and what, what your agenda is. So what we as, again, going back as mediators of the processes normally, what we try to do is to work on these expectations since the beginning. So try to mm -hmm. understand the expectations of, of everybody and trying to calm down and easy a little bit of some of the biggest expectations that we know already that we cannot uh, reach. And, and also introducing this uh, straight transparency between everybody. So everybody uh, becomes the more transparent in their um, goals and their needs and their expectation as we can since the beginning, because I, we think that it's a way to make our life easy in a way uh, right. on the development of the projects. Uh, and of course, sometimes, I mean, not all the projects go well. Uh, some, some, some of the projects, uh, you don't have so much people uh, happy about it or not all the people involved get what they expect. Uh, sometimes it's the outcome, sometimes it's the color, sometimes it's the money, sometimes it's uh, whatever. But, but yeah, it's, it's um, I think it's, you always have to be working on these both uh, dimensions. Yeah. So it's all about managing the expectations. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So how can this form of architecture be a vessel to promote greater values like unity, diversity, sustainability, and I think one that really shows up a lot these days and is becoming very, very important is inclusivity. I don't, I don't see it as a um, different architecture or different way of doing stuff. It's just one way. So it's, it's what we believe, it's what we do. So it's one of the ways of doing it. We don't look to other ways as wrong or right. That said, I mean, what we believe is that, especially if, I mean, we, we work a lot in, in the social and cultural fields and normally to start these two are not, not so together, especially if you think about inclusion. So there's a lot of uh, communities inside our society that don't have the same access to participation, to culture, to architecture, to, dis mm -hmm. to decision on, the, on, on 
public interventions or whatever. For us, it's uh, this is one of the ways that we 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 found or we are still looking for to involve these people. And one one of the things that we push a lot when we start, we we call it the the rebriefing. It's something that after somebody gave us a briefing, we we criticize it in a good way a little bit because sometimes what you get from a briefing uh, it's already very um, uh, strict uh, from the one that is giving uh, the, or passing you the, the briefing and sometimes it's, uh, even unconsciously is already putting some people out so normally we try to go a little bit deep and try to understand okay in the end if this person or this group of people are actually going to be the users of this space or this building, we need to get them already on the, on the project, not, not after, so it, it's now. And if they, if they decide uh, that the project should go this way and not that way, I mean, in between what our responsibilities are, like legislation, structurally, uh, aesthetic, every, everything, but in between this, we need to respect a little bit the, the, the things that these people share. So going back to your question, I think that by opening the process and by putting the architects close to everybody, not just the only 1% of the population that have money enough to buy, to, to buy or to pay an architect to build their expensive uh, weekend house, it's our way to try to get this inclusion as maximum as we can. If that is working or not, we don't know, but uh, we are still uh, believing that that could be the answer. And and I think that somehow uh, we do a lot of tutoring for universities of design and architecture. And it's also something that we believe that we could be positively, positively uh, influencing these, these young architects to, to grow a little bit more open in their profession. It's very small. If an architect looked to himself, only seeing that, you know, there's so many tools that we can use that I think it's a, it's a pity that we look to ourselves like that. Only. Yeah, I see. Yeah, I do really appreciate your being so transparent about the design process, the design thinking, and really opening it up to so many more people. And I think it is only by seeing this step-by-step -step process that you can really think about, you know, prioritizing expectations, like mitigating problems. So I think it's really key uh, to do this, not only in design, but maybe in like management also. Of course. In the end, well, I mean, if you are talking about uh, the process of public building or or just a building that are going to be used or space that's going to be used for with a lot of people, even if it's a temporary one. I mean, designing is just a really small part of the entire process. I mean, it's it's a lot of things. So designing, yeah, it's one of them. Uh, and, and it's a very responsible one because normally it takes a form and a shape that is going to be uh, in pose you know in a way but it's just a part of it so it's all this manage management that you are talking about all this relation sometimes we spend more time just gaining respect and confidence uh, with the people that we are going to work mm -hmm. than actually then just designing something so sometimes it's just a matter of time to just like to connect to understand to to be validated by the group of people or community or whatever and then actually design comes a little bit after sometimes. Yeah, so just appreciate the process. <laughs> As we are always trying to find uh, different answers, we are always working also in different fields. So still using the same tools that we have because we are not other stuff, we are what we are. And there's a limit of things that we can do, but still we are, always looking in different scales, different fields in a way. So we can do a project that it's just like a building, a temporary building or an intervention, right. or we can do like 12 years ago, we did like a festival for collaboration within the, the rehousing process, like a social housing processes. Uh, and it was like a festival that we did it for a couple of days. Uh, so it was 
I mean, it's not supposed in a way to be like an architect's work, but it's something that makes sense for us. And and the groups of people that were there, the the themes that were uh, be, uh, put on onto debate, uh, they are all from the urbanist and architectural world. So for us, it makes sense. Sometimes, I mean, the other day we did a project of uh, a bunch of benches for a uh, ice cream shop uh, that somehow reclaim a little bit the sidewalk uh, with these benches. So, I mean, it's uh, completely different scales, completely different uh, approaches, but somehow looking for the same values and, and using our, our tools. And I think that is something that we really, really like to to be able to do. And it's something that uh, reflects then on our work is the fact that we are uh, somehow able to be uh, on the construction site uh, building with our with our hands and tools in the morning, and then stop to lunch in a formal meeting with the municipality and suit up. We clean ourselves, suit up, and go to this meeting. And in the afternoon, uh, being in the inauguration of a cultural institute of an exhibition. So this kind of, as I said before, this like chameleon thing for us, uh, it's something that we we love to do it, but we also provoke in a good way because we know that we can get a lot from it, like professionally. Mm-hmm. Makes makes us really really humble because we we are not in any position different from other people and make us really close to a lot of actors that normally work on on the, on the projects so uh, like from institutions to citizen or a, a homeless guy or whatever so you know you, you can actually you are not them but you can be right uh, quite close to them to be aware of their context and these are i think it's a position that is very important for this mediator role that some sometimes we we need to assume in the in the projects or in the in the process. Mm. Nice, yeah. Thanks so much for highlighting how an architect is a very nimble profession that you can be just about anywhere, wear different hats, represent many different people, and it's all about managing and structuring these different components into success. So it's super humbling to learn from you, Ruben. So thanks so, so much for sharing. Thank you.